Hi, it's Calvin Niles, the Mindful Storyteller, and I am delighted to share with you stories of awakening. Each week, I'm going to be talking to people from around the world of various backgrounds and experiences. People I love, I know, and people I admire, but also those who are completely new to me. One thing all my guests will have in common is that they have been through a journey of awakening. By awakening, I mean a call to higher consciousness and deeper self-awareness beyond material reality. These stories will be real, challenging, funny, stimulating, and insightful. We're going to take our good time with these conversations. So listen from your comfy chair with your favorite drink, or on your weekend stroll, your morning routine, or whatever makes you happy. Stories of Awakening with me, Calvin Niles, and I look forward to you tuning in. Welcome to another episode of Stories of Awakening, and I am really, really excited about this conversation with my dear friend, Mark Sears. I've known Mark for many years now. Um, we worked together in the corporate space a long time ago when uh when the world looked very different for me and i'm sure it did for you as well mark yeah, it's <laughs> very different <laughs> yeah yeah so welcome um mark is a facilitator a catalyst and guide for growing uh regenerative cultures and um just an all-round interesting amazing person and i know the work that you're doing mark is uh, reflective of where you're at, but I don't even know how you arrived to this space. So I, I really am excited to learn um, your story and uh, what what was your sort of journey towards greater greater consciousness. Mm. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me, Calvin. It's just lovely, lovely to be to be here having this conversation. Yeah, where so where did it all begin for me? And it's I guess as I've journeyed into greater consciousness I've tried to you know tried to do that work which is trying to piece together where it all began for me and and actually it was a really it was a really clear moment in time as a child which was the thing that ignited the spark that somewhere down the line I came to realize was as an awakening of consciousness if you like um so I uh, I grew up um in in the black country of, of the west midlands in a little town called warsaw where it's actually quite a big town called warsaw just north of birmingham and um and i was it was the mid 1980s um it was that time of uh, margaret thatcher's dismantling of um of the industrial west midlands um, and lots of other places well it wasn't just the west midlands but um i, I it, it was quite a dark time um in, in lots of ways in my childhood. I, was, I remember being nine years old and um, I, I, like lots of nine-year-olds um, had the free, in the 1980s, had the freedom to get on my bike. And, you know, as long as I was home in time for tea, um, I could, I could, I could go wherever I liked. And I went to a canal bank. I remember this one particular day, I'd never been there before. And I went to a canal and on the, um, and it was kind of the and typical 1980s canal. So it's full of shopping trolleys in the, in the canal and sort of rusty tin. And I made a den just by myself. And I sat there and one, one moment, this incredible neon flash went along the canal from my right to my left. And I was like, what the hell, what, what is this? And then like a few minutes later, it went back the other way. And it was a kingfisher, a kingfisher bird, this beautiful neon and pink bird. And, you know, it was just this uh, in, extraordinary vision in this kind of bleak scene, if you like, for me. And then I'd go there most, you know, four or five times a week. And every time I'd see this extraordinary, this flash of light going up and down the, the canal. And I didn't know at the time, but it was quite an extraordinary thing that happened and um actually about after about a year um i think it was about a year that kingfisher one day didn't show and then the next day it didn't show and then it didn't show and it was that sort of sense of heartbreak so um but that kingfisher made me want to become an environmental scientist i kind of said right i'm, I'm gonna study things like kingfishers and get to know and love them so that kingfisher was a massive spark so i've always said there were two things two parts of my life 
two strands. And the first thing was <clears throat> the part of me that the Kingfisher activated, that, that, that thing, um, that spark of light that it gave me. And then on the other hand, was a sense of an activism that comes from growing up in, in, in a town that had had its, that was in the process of having its heart ripped out of it. Um, and the people there losing hope and losing losing the will so it's like those two things one a sense of an activism there's got to be a better way of living than this there's got to be something better than this and then this kingfisher this extraordinary thing so you know that was the start for me um yeah which is wow. uh, and it's taken quite a long time for me to kind of understand how powerful that moment was on that canal bank um but it, but I, I, I the more i feel into it the more i realize that was it that was the start mm, yeah so kind of spark of curiosity was lit by this light flashing by and did it lead you to investigate the kingfisher did it lead you to query something specific or was it just kind of like a seed that just like lay quietly there for a little while in the background I think it was one of those things where I, I didn't follow the Kingfisher explicitly. I'm going to follow this, get to know the Kingfisher. And partly because I didn't know where else I could find a Kingfisher. Once the Kingfisher had gone, I had no sense of where else you would find a Kingfisher. But what it did make me do was at school, it was all about biology and geography. And then so I, I, I went to study environmental science as a degree. But what I found when I did that, when, during the process of doing that study because that, that felt like the right thing to do it's like if i just scientifically understand the natural world that's that's the answer and the more i did that the more i realized that wasn't what i needed and wanted that wasn't if you like what the kingfisher was telling me <laughs> what, uh. the king, what, what the king what what i i guess possibly because that's what the expectations were or what what the, the systemic response was you know you should go and study scientifically um the natural world um and actually, it was the more I studied it, the more I wasn't interested in the science of it, the more I was interested, if you like, in the soul of that encounter. But of course, back in the early 1990s, there weren't there weren't courses that were talking about that, or at least I didn't know of them. Um, so I kind of did the study, did the science, and then kind of realized that wasn't that that wasn't the question that was being asked of me, you know. So um, I so they kind of became a disillusioned graduate um kind of going well i thought it was about that but you know it isn't i don't want to be an environmental consultant as wonderful and important as that that job is in the world that yeah. wasn't what i was being called to be hi if you're enjoying this conversation you might like soar book club many similar conversations are happening with soar book club a book club for the spiritually curious if you like spiritual books and community then why not join soar where we can grow together, learn together in a fun and nurturing environment. Click the link below in the description to find out more about Sora Book Club or to find out how you can join. It'd be nice to see you there. Yeah, yeah. Um, that explains so much why you love the outdoors and love the woods. And because I remember when we first met, you know, almost, I think it was almost a decade ago, almost. Um, I remember you going away into the woods for a weekend <laughs> and just literally by yourself with your tent and you'd go far out into the middle of nowhere and just that was your way of recalibrating um, because you kind of hinted to me anyway <laughs> back then. Uh, you didn't explicitly say this, but I guess you you felt that there was so much noise and chaos in the sort of ordinary nine to five world that we had at that time and you found this very anchoring very grounding and it was conscious thing i mean i suppose nature grounds us all did you always have that in you even from that time as a child with a kingfisher or did that develop later um when you became disillusioned in college or university mm, I, I i definitely had it from a child so um, and I guess even within this big post-industrial conurbation that is the West Midlands, um, but lucky enough to have parents that kind of understood there's a forest at the north northern edge called Cannock Chase, and we, that was where our weekends would be spent. That was where I felt, it's where I felt most alive. 
but it, it, I guess what happened is it kind of got lost. So just before we met um, that time, uh, th- there was, I, would, I was at that stage in my life where I'd still spend my weekends in the mountains. So I'd go to the Lake District, I'd go to Snowdonia and I'd try and bag as many peaks as possible over a short period of time it felt like it had got caught up in that sense of of the only way that you can value your time was that pursuit of that, that ticking off exercise that yeah I, i've conquered these mountains you know so i i'd gone through that process and i think it was aligned to where my career went in that sort of 10 15 years after graduating where actually i'd become disconnected from that i'd become disconnected from the kingfisher <laughs> if you like and actually, but there was something in it. I was like, okay, so it's the natural world. So I'm going to go to Snowdonia and I'm going to spend the weekend climbing as many mountains as possible. Um, and it being a very outward, a very yang kind of thing to do. Um, and it was only after a particular moment in time, a particular point where I came to realize, oh, gosh, that wasn't, that, that that's not working for me. I, I, I love climbing mountains still, but it was just that perhaps i'll just do one mountain and i'll lie down at the top for a bit <laughs> rather than try and do seven um it, that sense of there's a depth mm. that came in and i think at that time when i just started to go into the woods i was just yearning for that depth it was just like i, I was called to go into those woods and just to recognize my interconnection with everything and th- and, and i think you know as a human species everything that i've come to learn over the last few years is that we're, that we've forgotten that our, our bodies our minds are designed to be an absolute um uh interconnection into being if you like with all of the living world that's out there so all the kingfishers all the blackbirds but but you know every thing that exists in this living earth we are designed to be in in reciprocity with to work in in collaboration with and you go to the woods for the weekend and you can start to tap into that like that that 45,000 year old version of what it is to be a human and yeah. i just felt alive i still do when i do it and and then you go and sit in front of a screen nine o'clock on a monday morning and you're like this you know and, and actually all the science proves this now your, your brain is not designed to work in that way your body is not designed to work in that way and it just sort of like god allow me to go back to where i feel most alive to where i feel most human and 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 that was that process really um and you know once you do what i realize is once you do start to really take and invest the time and it does take time you know as much as i'm i'm quite an advocate for a 20 minute what i would call a sit spot where you just go and sit underneath a tree or in a place in the natural world yeah. and just do nothing i'm a big advocate of that but the depth of time these three or four days where you just become part of the forest then that's that's where magic happens um mm. Mm. and i think as a human species we urgently need to wake up to that yeah yeah i was in the forest last week actually funnily enough with a friend of mine and um we ended up there for four hours and didn't even realize it <laughs> just walking you know getting lost as well was it was wonderful but it does have that kind of rejuvenating power um when we reconnect with you know the trees and the sounds and that kind of the smells you know um so going back a little bit to this whole uh sort of you mentioned margaret thatcher and you know, um, as much as she was one of the architects of all the change that was happening in, in the Midlands and the industrial areas of the country, did that touch your life personally um, from a point of view? I mean, obviously it did, but from a point of view of switching on something else for you, because obviously the Kingfisher story and switching on this light of curiosity around nature how did that show up in the effect of the industrialization changes and so on yeah i mean luckily for my parents specifically we didn't impact us as a family my mom was a teacher um but there was um all around there's you saw people that lost hope um and 
lost a sense of purpose. Um, and, you know, it's not to say that that big factories churning out, um, you know, producing whole, whole, huge loads of stuff um, uh, and the side effects of that is in itself the perfect answer to anything. But it was just this sense of there was it, um, people that suddenly had it all removed from them without any sense of what support might be required um, to replace that. And so it was a sense of a sense of injustice, a sense that a sense of people around me losing hope, and it and it just ignited that thing. It's like it, there has to be a better way of organizing mm -hmm. our society and organizing our community than this. There has to be that the, 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 there has to be something. There has to be more imagination than this, which I felt. You know, when I, again, when I look back at that time. And I look at so many of our political decisions since then too. It's just a massive, massive lack of imagination and creativity about what might be possible. And so it was that sense of like, I don't know, just that real sense of there has to be something better than this. And and I guess that's the second that's the second part, uh, the second strand to my story, which was just we we need imagination, we need creativity, and we need to change stuff. Um, so that was the thread I picked up actually when I left university. Um, this dissolution graduate who'd realised he was doing science when actually he was interested in the soul, and um, and did you say did you say interested in the soul in soul? Yeah, okay, so I was interested yeah, in the soul yeah, of yeah, interested yeah. in the soul of kingfishers, not the science mm. of kingfishers. So so it, it was that. It. So so I kind of left university. I was like, well, what what then? What then? And that's when that second part of my the next part of my story that led me ultimately to meeting you. Um, 10 years ago or so um kind of started to kick off wow yeah that makes a lot of sense i mean the disillusionment in in university for me um i had a a really amazing uh gentleman on this show uh and i call him a gentleman specifically it's not a word i normally use but he is so gentle like such a lovable gentle man um and he mentioned um he said something and he said he you know he, divine discontent he called it <laughs> he says it's divine Love discontent it. and i was like is that what i was suffering from all this time excellent to know <laughs> um so was it kind of like that for you where you you got there um you know you, you sort of coming of age you're learning about the the whole ecological uh, world from a scientific point of view but did you have this kind of thing? This is wrong, and and a feeling of, in a way, being lost, maybe. Yeah, hundred percent, very lost. And mm. and the next move I made didn't necessarily wasn't necessarily part of finding, but wasn't the answer to finding myself. I now realise, but it was that sense of, I guess it's that energy you have when you're twenty one, that 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 red energy that says, right, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna change some stuff now, and so that. So that was when I, I'd moved back to the Midlands. I, I was in Leeds at, at university and I moved back to the Midlands. And so my, um, where the M6 and the M5 meet <laughs> in the West Midlands um, is I think it's the busiest section of motorway in Europe. And underneath that was the park where I played as a, as a child, as a sort of teenager. That was where yeah. I spent my teenage years. So I, that, that stretch of, motorway was very familiar to me and i remember very clearly um it was 1997 and richard branson of the virgin group he um he'd just taken over the west coast main line um the main route from london to birmingham and manchester and to, to scotland and uh, he, he'd made this big pr claim he said right we're going to grass over the m6 and uh, so you know the thought of that to me that noise that constant polluting roar above my head as a child i was like right that's Sounds like a great idea. I'm up for that. And uh, and they were I think they were just looking for some temporary workers, you know, to come to to come in. I think even their customer service, it wasn't their customer service team for a couple of weeks. So I I went in there and there was just something about that mission. There was something about the energy of the Virgin Group and what it stood for and what it uh, was 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 trying to do um, that felt like it fit that other part of me that wanted to shake up the ways of working, the ways of doing things. Um, so that's where I started. And then I guess the rest, the next bit was a little bit of a blur, you know, in my early twenties uh, up to, you know, through my, into my early thirties where I stayed within the Virgin group of companies and, um, Virgin trains for most of that. And I ended up in the, um, my early thirties, um, 
being taken on by the Virgin Group, this thing called Virgin Management, which um, licenses and um, governs the Virgin brand in all of the sort of 200 or so businesses that it has around the world. Um, and I went into there to be head of group brand strategy, which was just this extraordinary thing. And I, uh, the journey from disillusioned graduate to there, that, you know, it was an extraordinary thing to, to, to do. Yeah. Uh, something I'm very proud of. And, um, and, and there was, you know, within that time, we like s some of the things that the Virgin Group, the capacity that, that the Virgin Group has to reimagine the way that things do, you know, this thing that it stands for about, um, uh, uh, about the, the consumer's champion um, felt very right. It felt like we were changing stuff. Um, and that felt great um, at that time. But I guess what I came to realize at that point, well, I guess there was a, another very specific moment, which, so if the, if the first thing was the Kingfisher, the second thing I'll, I'll credit to my, uh, my daughter, who's now, she's now 11, but um, it was that moment of becoming a, a father was another like, wake up, wake up, wake up moment. If the way that the Kingfisher felt like it was a wake up moment to my nine-year-old self, to my, what was I, 35-year-old self, got the same wake up um, from from my daughter. Um, she didn't say it explicitly, of course, but it was that that moment changed me. Yeah. Uh, and so I was, you know, traveling around the world to different Virgin companies, evangelizing the Virgin brand. And I came to realize that actually um, this wasn't the kind of activism that I believed in anymore. Um, I think the Virgin brand at its core, brands, if you like, have the power and the capacity to change the stories we tell about the world. That's what I, I got excited about in the world of brand. But ultimately I felt, and I feel this of not just the Virgin brand, I feel this of pretty much every brand. They're not making, the leaders within that world are not making bold enough decisions, are not being courageous enough, are not being imaginative enough about its role uh, and how it can change things. And the closer I got to the center of the group, the more I actually felt there needed to be something different to that. But it took mm. the intervention of my daughter um, on that December morning to uh, to wake me up. And I and from that moment, uh, it didn't take long after that moment for me to leave to leave the Virgin Group with nothing to go for. It was just again a, another moment of complete disillusionment. A complete. Um, it was like stepping out into the into the wilderness, literally. Um, Mm. Uh, of, of unknowing it's like there has to be something else I felt like I'd been following the wrong trail all those years and yet I'm still very you know glad I did walk that trail but it felt like it was the wrong trail and um and um I guess the last 11 years I've been trying to trying to weave those two parts of me back together again um the activist the change maker the the, the person that wants to really shake things up and then this the, and the, this this I guess the thing that the Kingfisher woke up around our our interrelationship with the natural world. So, yeah, wow, I had no idea. That is that is really juicy and helpful for me actually, because <laughs> <laughs> it places so much, you know, of the stuff in context now. That um, you know, when our you know your and my paths crossed. Um, I would not have been able to put it into context in the same way. So your your daughter's like a messenger in some ways for you too, right? Because it seems to me that, you know, you had this first phase of discontent around university. The seed was sort of planted. It was ignited your curiosity and so on. And then the, the discontent happened in university and you were like, what is this? This isn't what I thought it was. This isn't, this doesn't feel right. Actually, I recognize the, that too, you know, and it only just hit me now as I'm speaking. <laughs> it just hit me that it's actually, it didn't feel right for me. Um, what is this? So I'm guessing it's, it must've been a similar feeling for you. It's not feeling right, is it? It's not just like a logical thing, right? A hundred percent, I think. And I think, again, in the world of work, so often the, the word feeling is really, it's a, it's a really not a very welcome word, word at all. And actually, the sense of it doesn't feel right, but it, 
uh, doesn't feel right to me in a way. I think we've we have stopped trusting that. Again, I go back to what it is to be um, uh, a truly, if you like, an indigenous or a wild human back to 45,000 years ago, uh, back to when our bodies and our minds evolved to be the way that they are today. And yeah. to feel something was the most powerful thing. If you felt under threat, you probably were. So you should probably get out of that place. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, 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 and I think we've, we've uh, I, you know, the more I tune into my feelings, well, and I, uh, it's definitely not perfect. But the more the more I tune into my feelings, the more I kind of realize oh, I, I kind of knew that, um, but at a deep level, um, and it was my brain that was doing the catching up, you know. Yeah. Um, and 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 you know, to that point of with my daughter being a messenger, I guess she she was. It was, and the way that the kingfisher woke me up, she woke me up, and she said, mm. you know, now I'm here. You've you know, hit, hit, there's there's some there's, there's you need to wake up. Mm. you know I, I need you to wake up for me um and i'm wow. not claiming i'm not claiming i'm fully woken up for her as she kind of enters her preteen moment I, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a new and interesting um trail that we step on together but it's that it is that sense of i need you i need you to wake up for me because i'm here now um there's something yeah. else something else afoot so um and then i think what i what i came to realize in that disillusionment the second time around if you like is that is the sense of what would it be like if you didn't know the answer? What would it be? What would it be like if you, if there was no answer, or if the only way to find the answer is just to go deeper into the unknowing un of it? Um, and it, I, you know, and that was the journey I've, I, 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 I stepped onto really, which was like, well, what? I don't know the answer, but I, I've got a hunch about the general direction, and, and I'm going to kind of spend some time wondering it didn't always feel that i didn't always feel that relaxed about it because you still got that thing which is a nagging, a, thing. nagging thing <laughs> nagging thing that, that's yeah, exactly yeah. it that yeah. if you like if you like the patriarchy in my head saying you know come on boy just get yourself you, you, your former um, head of group brand strategy for the virgin group of companies you know pull yeah. yourself together you know launch yeah. something do something uh, and every time i tried to do it if you like i elements of it sabotaged me like i sabotaged myself like mm. that's why i came to realize the deeper i went into my into feeling <laughs> the more i realized the more i tried to do things that were right for me the more that my body sabotaged them for me it, it, mm. you know i just didn't show up in the way i'd always i mean guessing that meteoric rise i think every job that i went for i got the job i always have that sense of i could and i don't mean that as a kind of to big myself up in any way but it was just that i had that I seem to have that knack of being able to um, energetically get myself into the right frame of mind that, that meant that I got the job. And after that moment, I, I couldn't do it anymore. You know, it's like yeah. I, I'd betray myself in my, and it wasn't, well, I actually wasn't betraying. It was a complete opposite of betrayal. It was being true to myself, but but I, it, it felt like a betrayal at the time. It's like, God, you just, God, I was so flat. That's of course, that's why, you know, and it was just, you know, that sense of, um, of, I needed to sit in this mess of unknowing. Um, mm -hmm. And that was the, that was the only way out. And, um, you know, I, I, it, it feels now the more I understand it, the more I language it, that it, it, it was, a, I was undergoing what you would call an underworld journey of sorts for a mm -hmm. while. Yeah. And, and of course there's that thing, which basically is that the way, well, the, the way out of the underworld is, is, down it's you don't come out of the underworld into the shiny light it's actually you just need to it's about it, it, it's 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 it, you dig your way out and um, mm. but when you come out things are different um, oh man yeah you yeah it, this is like creating so much space in me just listening to you um you know it's actually making me reflect a little bit as well i know i know that i'm in I'm sort of imagining your world and reflecting on my own world. <laughs> and I'm thinking, wow, yeah, what you're describing is I identify with so much of it. I actually remember when um, I was in uh, university, I actually dropped out of university. And I remember the, for the first year, um, I basically didn't turn up to many lectures. <laughs> but I still got the top grades in all my essays 
<laughs> because I'll just go to the library. I had a friend. I said, "Just what are the, what's the homework? <laughs> what are we reading now?" I just go to the library, read the book, write an essay, and and that was it. And I was so underfulfilled. And there was one day where this was the last. This was the day I decided to leave. I went all the way there. I walked all the way around this sprawling campus, this Brunel University, actually. And I walked all the way up to the lecture hall. And there's like a circle glass on the wooden door. And I could see everybody in the theater. And I put my hand to push the door. And it was like the door just kind of like way it felt on my hand. It was like, no, don't go in there. <laughs> it's really strange. You believe I went through all of that to get to that door. And I turned around and I said, I'm not going. I could not bring myself to go in. And that was when I left. And now what you're describing um, really puts that into context, this sense of feeling that something is wrong, not knowing what the right answer is, <laughs> but still taking that step. Um, that's huge, actually. Mm. And it's very helpful for me. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Oh, part. <laughs> my pleasure. I, I, and when you yeah. speak, when you speak, I just just then I it made me think of a really clear and vivid th threshold, mm. like a, a threshold moment. You know, this the idea of threshold is this this place where they would sort the wheat from the chaff. You know, the things that are useful and the things that are not useful, and they would fall into two different things. And you there's a, it literally becomes a threshold between the things that are useful, and the things that are not useful, and um, and yeah, it feels like that, those moments, you know, whether it was my, my kingfisher, the door that pushed against your hand, the yeah. birth of my daughter, there's a threshold. It's just, you know, mm. there are some things that are now useful and there are some things that are now not useful. Mm. Um, and yeah, they're powerful. And recognizing those threshold moments is a big thing, I think. Like, how do we, like when there's like, how, like putting your hand against the door and it not opening, like just kind of go, okay, th th there's something in that. It's not just, yeah. it's not i'm not being difficult i'm not being awkward i'm not I, you know this mm -hmm. is a, this is real there's actually a real thing going on for me mm -hmm. again trust trust isn't it yeah your yeah. body body knows what's going on or a deeper level than the brain and this is what i find really fascinating about you know you know your your own story and perspective too is that that consciousness obviously wasn't there you know for me at the time and like you say, with the Kingfisher thing, you didn't realize that that was actually how significant that moment was. Um, and I guess now where we are, and especially, you know, as this is kind of like your own journey as you're sharing, does that help you? Now you've got this consciousness, this awareness that says trust venture into the unknown you can't explain everything you know there is the threshold um there are these catalysts and wake-up moments that are pairing all the time does that help you to recognize them faster now today now that you could apply the awareness that you didn't have before are you seeing them happening faster are you seeing them even happening in the moment or maybe even do you sense they're coming mm. It's a really good, that's a great question. I, I think it's one of those, there's a lot to unlearn, I think. Is, there's, a, there's, a, there's an awful lot of conditioning that, that, that we, that we certainly I need to unlearn about the way that we respond to things. And so I still think I'm very much on that unlearning journey. And I think I absolutely am closer to that sense of, okay this is happening now this is how i might respond i don't think very often i'm in anticipation mode yet but i'm also conscious that there's that tension between between we, we we are still whether we like it or not most of us are still in or at least one foot in the world that would tell us not to trust those things not to believe those things on those days where uh, where my body is telling me get away from the screen get like you can't do this um go 
out to the river and sit by the river and wait for kingfishers. I'm lucky enough to live near a river now where I do see kingfishers most days. So it's like, it's the lovely, I'm so fortunate, but, but, but I still have an exact those same moments, my body telling me I can't do this anymore. The brain still conditioned by this patriarch, the, the patriarchal world that we're in that basically says, well, that's not useful. You know, that's that, you know, there's much work to be done. And particularly as my work now moves much more into sort of into social change, environmental change, like, you know, that sense of there's so much work to be done, Mark, you know, that, and so, so to still have the trust that sometimes rest is, and to disconnect um, and to take a step away from the doing is the biggest and best form of activism that there could possibly be um i still i still have trust issues with that i mean you know i I know it to be true and yet when it comes to it when it comes to making those responses on an everyday level i'm not there yet Hmm. it's work in progress yeah yeah it's that constant letting go isn't it constantly just and being able to let go i mean we're reading a book in our book club right now called letting go actually it's got i think it's called the power of letting go mm. by uh, john perkis who um who incidentally is actually going to come to the book club to talk about it but it's it kind of and all of these books about surrender and, and letting go seem to reinforce this point that you know you don't just let go once <laughs> you continue to letting go all the time you know um wow so that's a really rich journey uh and very a lot of wisdom that you've accumulated around around this what would you say where would you put the credit for much of this insight that you've gained now on all of this change hmm yeah, the credit. Yeah, the credit. It's um, <sighs> I mean, I'm 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 fortunate enough to have had that initial spark, and I don't. And I guess uh, some of the work that I've done since then around um, getting children to reconnect with nature has been a direct result of my, I guess, my recognition of that. That all nine-year-old boys and girls need to find their kingfisher moment. So I, I think for me the kingfisher moment is 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 like that's that's my first moment that I'm grateful for. Uh, you know I'm also in, within my family. You know to have the space to, and the trust to keep on going with this work. Um, and like a, a mum, for example, my mum she's an extraordinary wise and strong woman. And you know those days where you're not trusting yourself whether you're, when you're not, when you're going, you know, just, just go and get a job, Mark, you know what I mean? And um, she, like, always pushing me on, always pushing me on to do more. Um, and, I, and then, you know. Can I, can I ask you a question about that? Yeah, actually? yeah, please. Um, that's interesting that you, you should bring sort of your mother into the equation. Mm-hmm. Does she, is she on a conscious journey herself? Is she aware that she is awakening into something bigger herself and those sort of seeds are being continually given to you uh, it sounds like the kind of support that she's giving you uh would probably indicate that she has some kind of awareness there uh, is, well, is, is that right so so much um I think I take so much inspiration from her uh, uh, because so she was a teacher when I was a child, but she she actually became a, um, a a vicar in the Church of England. But she is, and she's just retired. So, but she's everything that you would not expect of your uh, average parish priest in the Church of England. Um, almost all of her ministry has been in. Um, she started off working in um, youth offenders. Um, uh, in, um, youth vendors institutes and then um and then she's moved on to work in women's prisons for most of her career so she and she basically says she uses religion as a way to bring a greater sense of spirituality into into the most marginalized voices so if you like religion is an access point for her to reach people with whom if she wasn't presenting as christian um she wouldn't have access to these most marginalized voices so in, in a sense she's kind of I mean, she, she's deeply um 
has a Christian faith, but it's kind of like, how do I use that to speak to the most marginalized voices too? So she's kind of like this, this wonderful way. She's like, she, she wants to disrupt, if you like, the way that, that she, you know, she's a classic disruptor, that, but that other part of it that is deeply inspiring. So, so, so she's like, yeah, I, I, I have, there's so much that's wrong with the institution of the church. So, but I can, by being in it, I can break it um, and change it and manipulate it. And, um, and that's, that's her, that's been her journey. So whenever I've been kind of questioning how, how, how within the world of brand, can I affect the kind of work, work, I think that she, she's like, sometimes you've just got to be in it and um, uh, in it to, to create the change. And I think she's reminded me of that. Uh, some of the uh, the language that I use about the work that I do is that I'm a bridge and actually, and I see her as a great inspiration of this. It's like, sometimes you've got to have your foot. Like we can't all run off to the woods. We can't uh, as much as, as much as the longing for me to do that is very strong. Often I'm going to go up to Dartmoor where I live and I'm going to just go and sit, um, uh, sit underneath a tour and, 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 and cut myself off from the world. And actually, we can't all do that. We actually, in my view, we need people to bridge, to, to kind of, to, to, to take the wisdom from that. Um, but then actually, what does it mean to take that and translate that to, and to, to make that an accessible thing for everybody? Because um, otherwise we're just going to have a whole bunch of people living in the woods and a whole bunch of people um, mm. are, that are unwilling and unprepared and unskilled to actually, to, to, um, to support people, to work with people, um, I'm all right, Jack, kind of thing. So I think that's the thing that you know, she taught. She 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 taught me is that actually we need people to sit within systems that are prepared to disrupt them because we can't all, you know, we can't all live out there in the in the wild. So actually, reminds me of another thing that I'm that I would consider to be the, I guess the, the thing that I'm most grateful for, one of the great the great teachers of of this transition that I've been on, um, has been the power of story. And by that, I mean big old myths, um, um, the stories, you know, most of our of human history, we've been, we live by the oral tradition, stories that have been passed, passed along be be way before we wrote anything down, stories that were told around the fireside. And I mean, there's, there's so much to say about what myth and story can teach us, but, but, you know, in the classic archetypal story, um, you know, the, the protagonist ha leaves the village and then they spend some time um, out in the wild, out in the forest, where in some degree they have to go through a process of letting go and you know be tempered by the wild, um, a, a kind of an underworld journey, if you like. But they never stay there. They, they never, ever stay there uh, in these stories. They never stay out in the wild. But they also never go back to the village um, because they can't live there in the village anymore. And there's this place that that it feels really rich and really powerful. Uh, and it's that crossroads um, at where the woods meet the village, if you like. Um, and that I think is that place where I'm aspiring to live. It's that, that, that bridge place, you know, where you're still in connection with the village, yeah. but you're, you're, you're still in deep connection with the deep wild that lives out there in the blue green forest beyond you. And, and so, so, I mean, there's a lot in that around myth and story and all, all that, but that, that, yeah, I think that, that, that mm. gift, that really simple analogy of what, where's this crossroads that you can be in, which means you can still, you still, if we're going to change the stuff and right now we need to move, we need to change so much, so fast, you know, there's so much broken in the world that, that requires our attention, our requires us to be woken up in my sense the only place that you can change that stuff from is there at the crossroads you know at the where the woods meet the village mm. if we can find that place then then i think we can really do some good work wow that's some inspiring stuff brother um i think i need some mentoring you want to mentor <laughs> me <laughs> oh mate i i'd say that i'd always say the same about you <laughs> Oh, I think so much. It actually reminds me too of um, because uh, recently Thich Nhat Han passed, didn't he? Um, mm. The famous Zen um, Buddhist monk who founded Plum Village, and you know, I remember that he he actually said once in an interview that you know when we're meditating, imagine meditating in a hole, 
Um, and he said, you know, we're in Vietnam during the war. Imagine you're sat in a hall meditating and there are bombs going off outside the hall. You know, we can't just sit there and continue to meditate while bombs are going, out, going off outside the hall. We need to help. And, and out of that was born his uh, model of uh, engaged Buddhism, which, which is essentially an activist arm of um, basically the, being the monastery. Uh, and typically, historically, if you committed to that path in the monastery, you wouldn't be as engaged in the same way externally in terms of social activism. And he completely changed that model because he felt that it was relevant for the times. And what you're saying to just now also kind of makes me think of that because it, it, it's very similar, isn't it? That kind of intersection point between the inner and the outer, between the woods and the village, between, you know, doing your personal spiritual work, but also showing up in the world. Um, it's really powerful um, point. I think that's also helpful for me too. So mm -hmm. I'm taking this whole conversation as just a big, nice lesson <laughs> for me. <laughs> I, I, and I think, but I think what you just, what you described that's a beautiful analogy. And I, I, like, I, we we see things as so binary, don't we? I mean, like there's so much in our society these days that is black and white, and there's no room for any nuance or anything in between. And what, everything you're describing there is that there's these tensions, these beautiful tensions. Um, that we have to just live with, and it's like, like as I said said earlier in the conversation, like there's this sense of to rest is this is the most powerful form of activism, but you can't rest forever. Yeah, <laughs> you know? it's like yeah. it's like so how do you find that balance point between doing and being? Like, mm. so I'm just going to be today. I'm just going to sit by the river with my kingfishers, and I'm going to just be as in, an interconnected human with the more than human world. And then you kind of go, well, what are you going to do with that? Like, what, what actually are you going to do with that? And holding those two things and finding some form of balance and this idea that there is a balance, you know, there's a perfect place of balance and it's just forever doing that in my, my world, you know, going up and down and up and down. Yeah. And, I, and I think, you know, it's like that, just getting comfortable in those balances and in those or, or imbalances and those, yeah, it, it feels like that's the work. Yeah, yeah. It's... it's... <laughs> It's so true. It's, it's never, it's never uh, just like, right, that's it. I've made it. I'm on the path. Okay, I remember when I, so when I dropped out of university, but what did I always want to do? Now, interestingly, I was actually doing film in university. So I was always into stories and I had already done media and college and journalism and writing. And I was always in this world of stories. I didn't know it though. Believe it or not, I didn't even realize it at the time. Uh, it's only now that I'm just so immersed in this uh, storytelling world and I'm bringing this aspect of consciousness as I reflect. I go, oh, actually, yeah, that's interesting. But I did leave and I said, well, what did I always want to do? And I trained to be an airline pilot. <laughs> and one, wow. of the, one of the things we actually used to talk about in when we were in like the student days, you know, flying around the single engine propeller planes, uh, there's an instrument in the aircraft called a VOR, very high frequency omnidirectional radio range. And it just basically helps you navigate the sky using land-based instruments. And let's say uh, I wanted to fly from where I am to where you are. There'd be like a beam of energy in the fluff flying through the air and the aircraft instrumentation will pick that up. Um, but remember you're in the air, right? So you have to kind of track that beam of energy to in order for me to fly to you. So just imagine like a line basically in the sky. And if you're off the, uh, the, the, um, the trajectory or the direction, then the needle would fling or, fl you know, one side to the other. And what, when you're a student pilot, you're constantly trying to get back onto this line. So you turn the aircraft, oh, it's over there. I better turn this way. And then you, as you fly straight past it because it's obviously invisible. So you're, you're having to calculate in your mind, what's the best way to intercept this line? And then you pass it again. Then you're, oh, it's over there. And they call that chasing the needle. 
<laughs> it's actually a thing called chasing the needle where you're constantly just doing like this big s in the sky <laughs> like there's left right left right flying around this line so i kind of imagine what you're saying to be you know this line is is there but you're you're having to continually do work to stay on it continually navigate the space to maintain this trajectory to maintain this direction um and I, I, yeah. it makes it makes me i love it and it makes me think because I, I my suspicion is when you you first start you're going all over the place because you're readjusting really wildly yeah and then as you get more experience you just realize that the t- it actually just requires a little just little nudges left for, and, I, and i guess that yeah. feels like it's a good analogy to metaphor because as you get more used to it you're still having to adjust yeah but the adjustments are less wild. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly the same, actually. Yeah, eventually you start to realise, well, actually, no, I shouldn't fly towards the line because I'm just going to be at 90 degrees to it. I'm just going to go that way. I need to maybe maybe go and close an, at an angle, but what angle is that? And, and gradually the angle gets a bit shallower depending on how far your, your destination is. And, and then you kind of just nicely intercept and then you maintain a light touch to... Mm. You know, and you correct for the winds, you know, and you count for that, and you count for the years. But it's really fascinating. Um, wow, we could talk forever, brother. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like we could. It feels like we could. So, what's the next step for you? Um, where Where are you now? And you've had this ripple. You've had this, you know, first awakening moment with the Kingfisher. You you know, it was that set on in the context or the backdrop of big industrial change going on in the country, especially in, 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 in the Midlands. And then you had this divine discontent, which I'm using, borrowing the language from Michael Taylor um, in university. And again, you had that again in, in Virgin when uh, your disillusionment hit again and you left when your daughter was born. Did that take you to another, did you have another big bang since? Yeah, I, well, I guess that, that, that unknowing period uh, and le- led me to a course just, so I'm in Devon now next to the River Dart and on the other side of the river, there's a college called Schumacher College. And it uh, kind of my winding trail led me to a course called the Call of the Wild um, down here at, at Schumacher College. And I guess that was that next point. That, that was so it's a year. It was like six long weekends over the year. Um, and I mean, it's kind of around environmental, edu- environmental education, but that doesn't do it justice at all in terms of what uh, I, I think that course offers. And I suppose that was my next big wake up. I mean, that course, that, that was the thing that said, now you can stop running up mountains or trying to as I got older. Um, and, uh, and, and now you can start to, you know, recognize our interrelationship that I keep talking about. That, that, I am only human in relationship to all of those things that happen in the in the in the natural world. So um, that course has led me on a whole trail of kind of uh, which led me into myth. It led me into story, but it also led me into sort of ways that we can, I guess, rewild ourselves. You know, if we can rewild ourselves, we can actually become more um, uh, more. Um, more in service, uh, but in service to something that's different to to the thing that most people are in service to, which is the pursuit of, of success and wealth and, and all of those things. So actually to be in service to life is the language that I'm uh, working with at the moment, because uh, what would it be like to I be in, ser- to, in service yeah. to life? And that, mm. of course, is your life. Mm. It's the life of the people I love, but it's also in, in service to the river, in service to, to the little patch of land that I call home, in service to to those around me that have less than me you know it's kind of like you can take that idea of being in service you know any on a proper old safari into the distance but but yeah to, to what what would it mean to be in service to life and um and and so a lot of the work that i'm doing now is 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 around that question um and increasingly look sort of developing what i would call unlearning journeys so you know how do we take start to walk that path and to unlearn some of those things that have probably been in us before we were born but actually certainly the things that have been um that we're taught and learnt and observed in others 
for all those years. So actually, how do we unlearn some of those behaviors and start to 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 recognize our interconnection with one another, um, with the world, with the divine, with all of these things yeah. that, that our bodies are, are perfectly, this is the thing that always gets me, our bodies are perfectly attuned. Like our, the way that our senses work, we are perfectly attuned as these massive vessels of absorption of things. And we've just switched it off. It's like switched off all of the all of the inputs, and um, so I, I guess. So this is really literally awakening the body. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, literally awakening the body. And again, as a so much of my, and for, it's not just me. You know, so much of us now is this, this, this disembodied way of being and there's so much more i need to learn about awakening the body to be this re receiver of information again but it feels yeah. like such a, an important thing it's like yeah there's all this we've been taught we've been told so much and yet we only recognize what we've been told by the thing that sits six inches in front of our face on the on that little <laughs> screen you know and it's yeah. like but we're constantly being told everything and mm. how do we wake up to that is like that that feels that feels like an important question mm. Wow, Mark, what a, I feel like that's a amazing moment hmm. to end, end uh, on, you know, that question of what does it mean to wake up to the being in service of life? Hmm. Yeah. I've actually written that down because it, it just hit me. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your time hmm. today. Uh, you put me in a bit of a reflective space in this conversation and it's still only 11 a.m. <laughs> the, whole, the whole day ahead of us. Uh, uh, thank you. I've really enjoyed it. It's just it's such a, a lovely space that you've got here just to kind of like, I don't know, ask deeper questions, ask better questions. That that feels like, like what you've got here. So I'm really grateful to spend the time. Thank you so much. What is most meaningful for you in 2022? Is it healing and forgiveness? Is it love and belonging? Or maybe it's the courage to be and to act. Soar Book Club has all of this for you. If you want to read more and need accountability to keep you moving forward in your already busy life, are you looking for inspiration to develop your spiritual awareness? Maybe you want to be part of a positive community during these uncertain times or connect with like-minded people who love stories and books. Then join Soar Book Club. Hop on board. The train is about to leave the station and I would love to have you on the journey with me. So click the link below to join. That's Soar Book Club with me, Calvin Niles. I hope to see you there.